This episode is brought to you by Ursa Minor Outfitters. Folks, I'm absolutely in love with my Loon mug. It's handmade. It's an absolute piece of art. Whether it's at the office or at the house, people keep asking to check it out. If you're not a Loon fan, they also have other beautiful mugs for wildlife fans of moose, bears, and eagles. They specialize in products highlighting the outdoors and local pride through quality design by local artists. They've even started expanding into items beyond mugs, like apparel, dog accessories, and soon candles and more. They also try to partner and highlight other small businesses, and in some cases, forgo profits in lieu of charitable giving to help their community, such as the dog rescue. So check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for our four-legged hiking partners, they also have a portable silicone dog bowl and also a sweet over-the-collar dog bandana. Go check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and don't forget to enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. Welcome, everyone, to a special bonus episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm your host, Ivan, and occasionally I'll be bringing you some bonus episodes, highlighting some amazing individuals who are participating in some fun outdoor events or helping some incredible nonprofits, as well as some up and coming outdoor companies. In today's episode, we're talking to Joe and Melissa, co founders of TELUS, an outdoor clothing company who are not only creating high quality, eco conscious outerwear, but actively providing their customers with the means to give back. TELUS allows you a way to not only explore the planet, but restore it by donating 100% of all net profits to an environmental initiative you choose at checkout. Joe and Melissa share their own personal hiking experiences, which includes both domestic and international bucket list destinations. They also share the story behind TELUS and how, in the face of climate change, they're providing adventure with purpose. And for Hikes and Mike's listeners, Joe and Melissa were gracious in providing a promo code to get 10% off your first purchase. Use promo code HikesMikes10 at checkout through April 2024. Without further ado, let's dive right into this episode featuring our guests, Joe and Melissa. Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm really excited to have these two guests with us today. They're going to be talking about their great outdoor brand, Tellus. They're based out of Colorado. Their names are Joe and Melissa. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you, Ivan, for having us. We're very happy to be here and excited about what you're doing. Ivan, I've been a big fan of yours for Hikes and Mikes, so very happy to be here. And so looking forward to your questions. You know, we always like to start off by asking our guests how long they've been hiking for and how they got started. Really, my hiking stemmed from my camping experiences when I was young. My parents moved to Southern California. And of course, in the 70s, what else do you do? But you buy a baby blue VW pop-up bus and you load your kids in it and you travel around. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah, for every family vacation throughout high school, we would just go exploring national parks and state parks, and we would explore the deserts in the area, and we would just camp on the beaches up and down the California coast. And for me, it was kind of living Tom Sawyer, just being outside all the time. And then when I was in high school, I researched a program with Colorado Outward Bound and convinced my father to send me on a 21-day backpacking trip. And I just got a lot out of it and fell in love with hiking. Um, You know, in that program, we're hiking every day, going over passes and bagging peaks. And I just got so much out of that program after college. I actually worked for Outward Bound for disadvantaged use and loved it. Haven't stopped since. Try to get out there and hike as much as I can. I try to take a a big trip every year with some friends in the fall, and uh, I will continue to do so as long as this body holds up. What about you, Melissa? Well, my story is a little bit different. I did not grow up in a family that wanted to go camping and, you know, the outdoors. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I spent most of my summers at sleep away camp, doing all the outdoor activities, you know, sleeping in the cabin with all the buddies. Um, But yeah, my family, we were not hikers and campers. So for me, my hiking really started when I became a Peace Corps volunteer. And that started because I lived in a rural community. But I would say my first true backpacking experience, it wasn't until after I met Joe, 
Um, and that was in the Maroon Bells in 2002. I love your guys' backstory on how you guys each individually got started with hiking. As you've been able to travel and backpack and hike together, do each of you have a certain type of adventure that you like to take in the outdoors? So, you know, being late to backpacking and camping and that kind of just, you know, like walk off into the woods, like thinking about yourself being someone who started doing solos. My most loved adventures are the ones that we do as a family with our girls and sometimes with our extended family. But the things I do like to do now as you know, as I've gotten older and my kids are getting older and they don't want to hang out with me as much anymore are things that I do with friends who, you know, adventures that we like to take. Um, we go do things that it pushes me outside of my comfort zone. And so I would say my most recent favorite trip was a girl's trip to the San Juan Island. It was like a multi-day adventure. It was all female. We kayaked, we hiked, we camped, and it was just awesome. Yeah, so I like to do things that I step away. I'm out there. I'm learning something new. I'm challenged, and I'm out of my comfort zone. Yeah, for me, if I don't get outside on a daily basis, I get a little grumpy. I do everything I can to find a way to constantly get outside, especially living in, in beautiful Colorado. We have so many outlets out here. It's incredible. And, you know, right even before this podcast, I even had to take a for a walk, you know, outside just to get out there. For me, you know, it's it's all things hiking. It's all things backpacking, skiing, cross-country skiing, paddleboarding. You know, especially we have three daughters, getting them involved in any way we can. And uh, we've made it a point. So the last, oh, right pre-COVID, last six years, we've uh, taken larger trips to different areas around the world every few years. And so that always involves some type of outdoor activity. And hiking is always a part of that. So uh, it is a family experience at this point in time. It's, it's such a pleasure to pass that a lot onto our kids and see the joy that they're getting from it as well. So uh, I'm almost more comfortable outside than I am. What's really great now is the kids have gotten older and you have all the devices out there. What's great is when you make them unplug and you have to be outside and you can't be noodling around on your device. It's, yeah. it's really great. You know, you, you've mentioned that you have three daughters and you've been able to pass along that passion for the outdoors to the three of them. What are some of the family adventures you've gone on with your daughters recently? We've had a couple of big trips in the last couple of years. You know, as they've gotten older, they can do more. You know, when they're younger, they're little legs like, can't quite keep pace. But the last few years, our big trips have been, uh, we've done the Galapagos with the girls uh, that involved hiking and snorkeling and kayaking. Um, and then our most recent trip was a multi-day, multi-adventure in Croatia with hiking and biking and kayaking. But I would say, when I look back, it all started with a tent in our living room, um, which is really cute. And they wanted to go camping. And so we had it set up in the living room. The tent then moved to the backyard. And then we inherited those parents' pop-up camper. And that took us on the road, which was great. So I would say my favorite trip, you know, in the pop-up were Glacier National Park was my all-time favorite trip with the kids. Such a beautiful place. I mean, the hiking, the kayaking, skipping rocks in the water. It's just a place everyone should take their family. Oh, that's wonderful. It, it's great to see the diversity out on the trails and seeing families out there from, you know, kids of all different ages getting to enjoy the outdoors. It's great to see that next generation getting outside to see people outdoors. It's, it's always a great thing to see. Now, Joan, Melissa, you guys are based out of the great state of Colorado, which in my opinion is like the quintessential outdoor state in all the United States. I think you guys have a little bit of everything from, you know, your 14ers to your deserts to your sand dudes. Being based out of Colorado, I'm, I'm interested in what are some of your favorite hikes in and around the state? As you mentioned, Colorado, and we're, first off, we're very fortunate to be in the state. Uh, we, we've been here 23 years, and we, we are just in love with the state of Colorado and what it has to offer. We are in Fort Collins, Colorado. So Colorado State University is here. We are just north of Boulder. So we have the majority of our quick access is northern Colorado. So uh, as I mentioned before, Raywall Wilderness is our closest wilderness, absolutely gorgeous. Pruder River, which is Fort Collins' main water source, runs through the Raywa. 
many opportunities on hikes, dozens of hikes. Some of my favorites are West Branch Trail, uh, Michigan Ditch Trail going up to the crags. But uh, Cameron Pass area is just, just, just amazing. Just a little further out is Mount Zirkle Wilderness, one of my favorites, full of creeks and waterfalls and rivers. That's towards Steamboat here in Colorado. Uh, the Gore Range is a little more, more central, but that's another recommendation I would throw out there. Wonderful. In the fall, the colors and the yellows and the oranges and the reds are just absolutely amazing, especially with the changing of the aspens, if you can hit it right, you know, and typically in mid-October. So we, we have plenty to go around, obviously Rocky Mountain National Park, but you can spend just on northern Colorado alone, you can spend a lifetime just exploring the area. And I do have a quick add. Mm -hmm. If you're in Fort Collins, the Poudre Canyon, I don't know if Joe mentioned it, there's tons of trails up the Poudre Canyon. And then the most fun is after a good hike, lunch at the Mishawaka. It's <laughs> like, you got to do it. If you're in Fort Collins, you got to hike in the canyon and you got to have lunch at the Mish. Oh, okay. Gonna have to add those to the bucket list for Colorado. Now, Joe, you've made it to some bucket list destinations outside of the United States. I think for most hikers, if not all, Patagonia and the Dolomites are up there on bucket list destinations. Can you share a little bit with us about your experiences at both of those beautiful destinations? Yes, exactly right. Bucket listers, been an avid backpacker, like I said, for years and uh, trying to check the boxes on, on the big ones. And Patagonia and the Dolomites were always part of that bucket list. Just starting with Patagonia, we, we actually went to Chilean side. We went to Torres del Pine, fairly popular area for anybody going down to Patagonia. Usually it's Torres del Pine or Tierra del Fuego, which is on the Argentinian side. Once again, I mean, topography, just absolutely amazing. I mean, such a vast, vast area. I'm just breathtaking. It really is. So you, you just you look 360 degrees around you. You're just amazed. And that happens the entire time you're down there. It's literally one of the most uninhabited places on Earth. What's, what's crazy about Patagonia, it's got 17,000 glaciers, which people don't realize mm -hmm. that are over, you know, some of them are two, two and a half million years old. So these things have been around for a while. The, the largest glacier is by the name of Gray Glacier, which is 17 miles long, which we actually spent an entire day hiking along this glacier, which was just, I mean, I was just marveling at this for the entire day, how, how expansive this glacier is. But it, once again, it's bittersweet with global warming, which I'm a believer in. Uh, these glaciers are receding at unprecedented speeds, which is very sad. Even our guide that was uh, with us for eight days, we did the, the W and, and the O trail, started with the O, that went into the W, which is a loop trail. I would, I would strongly suggest if you have the time to hit both those trails, W being the most popular. He showed us how, you know, how far the Gray Glacier exceeded just in the six years that he was a guide or has been a guide down there. Yeah, I mean, just amazing. I mean, you got the famous towers, um, which you got the north, the center, and the, and the south towers, which are 8,000 feet high, just coming off the sea level. So these things are just spiking straight out of the earth and just beautiful. And then animal life is just fascinating. You got the Wanako, which is part of the llama family. You got pumas, which we saw a few, actually a few too close for comfort, which is part of the experience. You got fox species. You even got armadillos, which I was fascinated at, like how the heck did armadillos end up in Patagonia? Patagonia, but they got down there. So yeah, just amazing, amazing area. And then uh, the Dolomites, Italian Dolomites, we're in Italy for a week, which expands obviously into Spain as well. Absolutely just amazing peaks, just to see it peaks, 2000 peaks strong. Eye candy everywhere, very jagged, you know, it goes straight up. And if you ever remember, I'm, I'm a National Geographic reader, but the famous Iceman that they found, the old mummy, a 5,000 year old mummy that came out of the glaciers uh, was out of the Dolomites. Oh, wow. But uh, I'll tell you, the, uh, yeah, the Italians' perception on hiking is definitely different than, than others, or especially than, than us in the U.S. I mean, we had a section in the, uh, if I pronounce this right, which I'm not going to give it justice, is the Via Ferrette. We spent almost an entire day, you know, on these series of ladders and hooking up the cables, which, you know, believe it or not, being an avid backpacker, I still fight fear of 
heights, you know, which uh, I think it's uh, a challenge for me, which, you know, I, I have been battling, but it's something that I take on. But when you have a series of ladders and cables that you have to manipulate getting over a particular pass for six, six, seven hours, it definitely keeps your focus, let's just say the least, for, for that time. But wonderful experience. We, we actually didn't tent camp. We stayed at refugios along the way, which are like hostels. And great part about it is you can spend, you know, you can have a 10, 12, 14 hour hiking day. And then you come into these refugios and uh, they make these wonderful Italian meals, which you're a bit spoiled with some Italian wine. So if you can ever indulge and uh, participate and take a trip out to the, that area, both Patagonia and the Dolomites, you know, definitely go for it. And I got to ask, Joe, because, you know, one of my biggest things when it comes to my pack list is having enough food. When it comes to the Dolomites, because you have those refugios, do you not have to pack as much food? Um, it's more like snacks. Exactly right. So you're packing basically your lunch and snacks to get you through the day. So you're really just packing your clothes. So it, it becomes a 30, 35 pound pack, which is very reasonable. Now, Melissa, you and Joe have a great origin story because you guys crossed paths in the Peace Corps, though you were serving in two different countries. Can you share a little bit about meeting each other in the Peace Corps and about that experience and how it helped solidify both of your lifelong commitments to making the world a better place? It's funny. So I don't know, for me, like personally, meeting Joe there was great. That was total coincidence. But I was stationed in Haiti. Joe was in the DR, underdeveloped countries. You know, your perspective on life is changed. You know, you just can't approach life the same way after you have lived someplace else that is not like where you grew up. And, and that's so different and that's so imbalanced and inequitable. Uh, there just There's just so many things around it. So uh, for me personally, as far as my commitment, what Peace Corps gave me, uh, one, I learned so much from the experience than I think I gave. And then when I was leaving the country, it, it changed my mindset on what I wanted to do. And then I hit this speed bump called Joe Basta, <laughs> who like derailed me. So I was at the final few weeks of my service. I was in Haiti for almost three and a half years. I'm coming out of service. I applied to graduate programs. You know, it just changed my perspective. There were so many experiences I had along the way where I was like, gosh, there's so much that could be done right here with businesses that are involved, with the people that, that are involved, if it was just done in a better way. Yeah, the, the few people I've been able to interact that have done the Peace Corps, it's something that they always carry with them and it really propels them in a direction that might be slightly different from when they first joined. I'm wondering, is there any specific story or experience that shaped your connection to the outdoors that kind of ultimately sparked the idea for creating TELUS? Once again, obviously, as Melissa stated, Peace Corps was a um, incredible experience for us. You, you know, when, you, when you're living in a developing country and surrounded by some of the poor of the poorest people in the world, it's definitely an eye opener for you. And you really see how poverty firsthand is a contributor to major environmental problems, such as water and air pollution, deforestation, land degradation. I can keep going here. In my previous life, I also was able to work in some African countries, Madagascar and Uganda in particular. So for roughly 20 years of my life, I was up close and personal to those countries, which were truly developing countries and very, very poor countries and getting back to just families doing everything possible just to provide the basics for themselves and their children, you know, from you name it, food, clothing, lucky enough to send their children to school. So it really, it kind of gets into not only our life experiences through places like the Peace Corps, my career, Melissa's previous career, having a love for the outdoors and just really trying to do the right things from the get-go. You know, we've been definitely drinking through a fire hose for the last two and a half years through design and development of TELUS. And strictly just using, which 100% of our products use recycled and organic materials. You know, we wanted to make sure that not only our products look, feel, and fit good, but also are durable for the, you know, towards the elements. And we're making products that will stick around for a lifetime. I would say there's there's many situations, this being kind of our third business that really has put things in perspective for us. Uh, that's great that, that you guys are using organic and recycled materials because I'm starting to see on, on my local trails 
just a lot of single use plastics from yeah. people's pack list. Mm -hmm. So you guys using 100% recycled and organic materials caught my attention. But then the other thing, Melissa, that caught my attention is that you guys are also donating 100% of your net profits to environmental initiatives that customers at checkout can choose from. Can you share a little bit about what those initiatives are? So we did a lot of research, knowing that the industry itself is hard on the environment. It's like in the top three of damaging the environment. We wanted to invest in these programs to change the tide there. So we researched probably 50 plus organizations to come up with like who made the most sense for us. And our initial idea was to have three different organizations, you know, with three different focuses. In the end, we landed on the Nature Conservancy, which is one of the leading organizations in the world on conservation efforts. And we decided on them because their programming is so strong. It's so strong in the state of Colorado, which is our home. It's so strong around the country and globally. They're partnering with organizations all over the world to make change. They're science-based research. They are apolitical. So, you know, they kind of just hit all the notes for us. So in launching TELUS, we wanted people to be able to give to something that resonated with them, whether it was in their backyard, across the country, outside of the country. And the three initiatives we picked were the Colorado Healthy Forests and Watersheds Initiative, which is the Nature Conservancy working on replanting 500,000 acres of forests. Now, the other one we picked was America the Beautiful, which is a national campaign to protect 30% of lands and waters by 2030. Uh, and that's a program we felt like anybody around the United States who likes us could be a part of. If you're not a Colorado person, hey, you can give back to America the Beautiful campaign. And then the Super Reef Initiative, which is a global program protecting super reefs around the world. Um, and they're called super reefs because these reefs are proving to be more resilient in the warming waters of climate change. So we picked three programs within the Nature Conservancy that we felt like anybody could get behind and participate in, and that would actually make a big difference. Oh, that's wonderful that you guys give different options because, I mean, all three of them I connect with. But for me, especially living in Hawaii for almost a decade, I got to see the impacts of global warming on the local reefs in and around Oahu and then post-pandemic to see the recovery and resiliency. Mm -hmm. So that's really great that you guys are supporting some, some amazing initiatives. On the other end, you guys are using those recycled materials and organic materials. What are some of those innovative materials that you guys are using or practices? Um, to help minimize TELUS's environmental footprint. As I, as I mentioned, 100% of our products are made out of recycled and organic materials. We also use strict standards when it comes to our materials with various certifications. So not only is 100% of our products made out of organic and recycled materials, but 100% of our products are also Blue Sign certified. And for those who don't know what Blue Sign certification means, it basically ensures safety of your workers and materials from any harmful chemicals, which is very important. But there's definitely several products that are really, really kind of neat. There's, there's, I mean, the innovation is just incredible and new, new materials are coming out all the time. But a really cool product that we're using is the name of Seawall. Oh, it uses actually pulverized oyster shells, which are collected from beaches. And it's actually blended with recycled water bottles that come off the beaches as well. So it's a product of oyster shells blended in with recycled, essentially recycled polyester to make a material that actually is very soft. It's in several of our performance products. Very neat product. It's actually one of our more popular materials that are, that's being sold today. And the last example that we use is a product made here in the U.S., which we're very proud of by the name of X-Pack. And we use that in our duffel bags and in our backpacks. And that's made out of 100% recycled polyester and definitely built to last. Really cool. If you get a chance, check them out. Really cool duffel bags and backpack, but very, very durable materials. So those are just a few examples that we do. But once again, it's just getting back to how do we do things from the get-go. So we've done a very deep dive over the, over the last two and a half years on materials, and we will continue to do so for, for future products. I feel like in the last several years, companies, especially outdoor companies, are trying to combine the sense of adventure 
but also a purpose. And I, I feel like you guys are doing something that not many companies are, are doing yet. And that's, you know, making amazing quality products, but also being sure that the impact to the environment is little to none. How do you guys balance the offering a great product, but also minimize your environmental footprint? Well, I think we're small for one. Um, so I think for a lot of the outdoor companies that are out there trying to make the change, I think it's great. I wish they'd do more because they're a lot bigger than us and they have way more funding than we do um, and they could do more. So we came into this, you know, we're brand new. We launched in November, but coming in this way, we thought, well, you know, if we're coming in, we don't want to say we're going to try to meet goals by 2030 or 2050 or whatever it is. Let's just start out of the gate doing it right. And so uh, I, I don't want to poo-poo any of our competition because I know there's a lot of them out there trying to do great things. And for some of them, I think it's like turning the Titanic. So for us, we're small, we're lean, we're being very specific. And part of it is to maybe poke the bear a little bit, like, hey, we can do better. You know, there are options out there for better ways to make these products. One thing that, that caught my attention is you guys do have a diverse line of merchandise that people can buy and check out on your guys' website. I'm wondering, can you share like what some of the outdoor experiences or preferences TELUS is kind of catering to? Is it more backpacking, hiking, climbing? I, mean, I think it's, it's a great question. Being in Colorado, being in, in a college town, that is very diverse when it comes to outdoor activities. It was just a great test market for us to be a part of. Our interest here in Northern Colorado, obviously it's all connected to Colorado, but there's still very diverse interests, as you were mentioning. I mean, you, you got different communities here. You got your hikers, you got your backpackers, you got your bikers, you got your runners, you got your skiers, your fishing, your kayaking, your paddle boarding, your bird watching. So we developed 36 products over the last two and a half years, which we just launched last year, in November. Obviously, we can't be all things to all people. Me being an avid hiker, me being an avid backpacker, it's maybe a little skewed in that direction. But still, I think there's a little bit for everyone. When it comes to like our performance wear, not only can you wear it as a base layer, a mid layer, you can take it out fishing. It's got a hoodie. It's got sun protection, you know, properties. Even our jackets, you, you know, we have mid layers. We have outer layers that can work if not only if you're taking a dog for a walk or going on a mountain expedition or even a hike or a multi-day backpacking trip. So in my opinion, our pieces are pretty versatile and I do feel we embody all adventure preferences. So, um, you know, and this is just phase one for us. And there'll, there'll be other phases that really kind of drill down into those different communities of activities and preferences. But I do feel for anybody who enjoys being outside, we, we do have a little bit for everyone. Um, now, Melissa, both you and Joe believe in the importance of preserving the beauty of our planet, not just for our generations, but future generations, your, your daughters and, and future generations to come. What specific actions is TELUS taking to promote sustainability through its adventures. One of the biggest things that we do, like going into this and everything that we do, we just, we ask ourselves a series of questions and then that kind of drives like our decisions and how we move forward that they kind of guide us. But we ask questions, you know, like where is the product made? Who are the people behind its production? What materials are being used? How are they being manufactured? What certifications do our partners have? So we ask ourselves those questions to kind of then direct us on the decisions we make in who we align with in Vietnam and how we move forward through the process. So we start with the questions and we go from there. But then, you know, drilling down on it a little bit more with who's making our product, we have been to see all of our manufacturers. We've visited, we have five manufacturers in Vietnam. Our mills are next on our list. So, you know, Joe's philosophies, big boots on the ground, you know, seeing is believing. So while we've tackled Vietnam, our fabrics are coming from other countries, one being the U.S. Our next step is to go all the way to visit the mills and see where our fabrics are coming from. They have certifications and we feel very comfortable with our selections there, but we like to see and meet everyone who is a part of our supply chain. You know, you guys have both touched on this. We hear, especially in the news lately, 
about goals by 2030 or 2040. I'm wondering, how are you guys measuring your social impact beyond just, you know, the certifications and how are you measuring your goals? You know, so it's interesting. I think for this question, you know, we're different. Um, Our economic success means the environment wins just simply through our give back pledge. One fact in all of our research that we've done that just stands out to me so, you know, just bold in my face, um, and it is that less than 2% of all charitable giving in the United States goes to environmental causes. Like, how is that possible when you look at just the last year of events around the world, you know, with regard to climate change, or you look at the numbers on biodiversity? It was such a wake-up call for me personally to see that low percentage. I was just shocked. So I guess for me, an increase in what we can reinvest. So through our give back, what we can reinvest. So it does go kind of back to the economic piece of it. You know, the more we can give back and reinvest in environmental initiatives and make improvements there, the social impacts will follow. Um, so I could give you a couple of examples. You know, like, for example, we're involved in the reef protection and restoration. That's what we're supporting at the Nature Conservancy. You know, reefs, they're beautiful to look at, but it's also important to remember that they're home to one-fourth of all marine species. They provide over half a billion people with food, and they protect our shorelines from storms and erosion. I think on the land and water conservation side, you know, just helping to sustain farming and fishing, conserving places with historic and recreational value and securing clean air and water for future generations. It's huge. That's the third program at the Nature Conservancy that we're supporting. And then in Colorado, when we look at supporting healthy forests and watersheds, well, healthy watersheds, they ensure clean water for people, for wildlife, for agriculture. That in turn supports food production. It supports other industry. It supports outdoor recreation, you know, all of it. So the social impacts come from because we're a social enterprise, come from our economy. And so for us, the more we can bring in, the more we can support change. I love what you guys are doing. And you guys are an inspiration for for taking the stance with your company. And I'm wondering for for those that are out there that are interested in creating a company that has a purpose behind it, do you have any advice to give to those individuals that maybe want to combine their passions and create a business like Telus? To your point, a passion has such a big role in all this. If you're not passionate about anything, you're, you're not going to do yourself justice. So be passionate. Definitely love what you do. Do your research. And I'm going to say know what you want. That's pretty much it. I can add to that a little bit. I do have, you know, I I liked that question because so there's a Haitian proverb. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was Peace Corps in Haiti and uh, it's kind of it's a little silly, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, And I'll, I'll say it in English, but it's even the frog's pee adds to the river. So. It's the idea that every little bit makes a difference. The the simplest thing you could do, like if you think about like that, there's 8 billion people on the planet, 330 million people in the United States, and we're the super users of the resources of the world, right? We're, we're, we're like in the top three of gobbling up all the resources. If just in our country alone, all of us could realize that the tiny little thing that we could do to make a difference, smallest like change. smallest change makes a difference, use less water bring your bags to the grocery store, just all those little things add up. It's just goes back to the Jack Johnson, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, regenerate. You know, it's a simple message that people could just employ more. So John, Melissa, you know, for our listeners that are tuning into this episode, can you share what your ultimate vision is for TELUS and what are some of the goals you guys have for 2024? Yeah, it's 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 definitely, you know, forming this this company and this social enterprise uh, has been quite unique, not only to us, but to a lot of our customers. You know, there was a great quote from Gandhi, which he said, be the change you want to see in the world. And, uh, you know, our ultimate change and goal is what we want to see is to really leave this world in a better place than how we found it. I don't want to be too cliche about that, but it's true for us. Um, even getting back to my old Outward Bound days, there was a slogan which is very popular in the hiking and backpacking world still today. And this actually came out in the early or late 80s. 
early 90s of leave no trace. And we really do need to get back to these words, which are very important to tell us and, and our company. In regards to this year's goals, really spreading our message, being such a new company that we are a true social enterprise and making incredible products, giving back 100% to some great environmental causes. Education is a big piece for us to just continue to educate our customers, to be able to make a positive impact on the industry, continue our community involvement outside our giving and our give back a hundred. We are supporting a number of local organizations who are doing some fantastic work here locally in the state of Colorado. So um, those, those are just a few thoughts to both the vision and goals for 2024, which is already, already taken away on us. I'm really excited to see you guys' growth in 2024 and, and what's to come for the company. You guys are making an incredible line of products and just the, the mission and goals behind it is just something that I definitely support because I've seen the impacts of global warming and, and just on the trail, seeing all the single-use plastics is just heartbreaking to see. So I'm really, really glad that you guys are making a positive impact with your your company and being able to share that love for the outdoors and sustainability is just great to see. Now, the last couple of questions, Thank guys, you. are pretty fun questions. I always like to ask these to our guests just to, to learn a little bit more about them. So the first one is, you know, I feel like especially day hikers I and mean, even some backpackers, they have a regular summit routine or maybe it's an end of the hike routine. For some, it's packing their favorite snack. For others, it's, you know, summit beers or their favorite beverage. And then for a few, it's just having a moment of zen or looking forward to the meal afterwards. Do each of you have a regular customer routine that you do when you reach your destination or when you make it back out? I, I do. You, you know, and actually, I, I learned this from two Germans oh, about 25 years ago. They were in, in Colorado climbing. I think it was Mount Albert, which is our tallest uh, 14 er in Colorado. A friend of mine and I were climbing, and they were drinking two German beers at the peak of Mount Albert, which I thought was really, really cool. So we've continued that tradition, or acquired that tradition of having a beer at a peak or at the end of a long day's hike. So that's my personal tradition. When it comes to your guys' pack list, I'm interested in, in hearing this. Is there a luxury item that each of you carry that falls out of the essentials list? It is on the essentials list. I mean, you're going to love this story. So I told you my, my very first backpacking trip was with Joe in the Maroon Bells. And I probably didn't even know what the 10 essentials were. But let's just say we got to our campsite <laughs> after hiking all day to get there. And we didn't have tent poles. I forgot the tent poles. Joe forgot the tent poles. So being experienced, yeah. I borrowed the tent from my buddy. So hey. for the girl from <laughs> Indiana who had never been backpacking to hike into the Maroon Bells and then show up at a site and then to be told there are no, I thought he was kidding. So I'm like, oh, come on, you're joking. And he's like, no, I'm not joking. I, I don't have the tent poles. And I was like, oh, my. Well, we are going to hang that tent somehow. <laughs> so we took every shoelace off of every shoe. Yeah. And I was not asleep. He was like, well, we could just throw our sleeping bags, you know, over here yeah. by the fire. And I was like, oh, and we I, don't do that. I'm from the Midwest. Car no, no. I carved some sticks. It was like almost like a puppeteer type of situation. Wow. Yeah. And we strung it from a tree. And like literally, street. yeah, this fabric was just like laying on our faces. There was really nothing to it. <laughs> so so I felt very safe and secure. So my luxury item would be tent poles. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and how about you, Joe? Getting back to trying to pack lighter, which I still haven't figured out. I, I have a little metal coffee percolator. I'm a bit of a coffee snob, especially in the outdoors. I just love a great cup of coffee in the morning. I have a miniature kind of Italian coffee percolator that I still throw in my pack. There's been a couple guests that, you know, when it comes to coffee, and that that's something I struggle with is, you know, they have the instant coffee for backpackers, but it's just not the same. Yeah. Sometimes no, you just a no. good cup of coffee in the morning in the outdoors to start the day. I know you're in Starbucks land, but that instant via is still not the same as a good percolated cup of no, coffee. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> we are just at the end of the, the winter months. Do you guys have any hiking or travel goals for the remainder of the year? As I mentioned before, I, we, we, I have a group of eight friends 
that have been doing this for 30 plus years. And we, we try to find a different location every year that we've never done before. So it's always up for debate. And uh, we typically take a vote on it. So this year, Pacific Crest Trail, uh, not not too far from you, uh, on the Oregon side is on the list. And I've never hiked or backpacked the Smoky Mountains mm, is on the okay. list. Uh, so this is always happens in the fall and usually September for us. But um, we, we've been doing this, like I said, every year. And it's always, it's, it's just a ton of fun going to a new location that you're not used to. But uh, looking forward to it. How about you, Melissa? Something that really piqued my interest, and this came from doing research for TELUS, which is interesting. You know, we're looking at how to like connect to things that make sense for who we are as a a company. But I was uh, researching festivals around Colorado and I had never heard of it before. And I find it so fascinating because I love the wildflowers in Colorado in the spring. But there is the Crest of Butte Wildflower Festival in the spring late spring, early summer. That looks absolutely amazing. So I got totally sucked into their website and they have an 11 mile hike that takes you from Crested Butte to Aspen. And so for me, I was like, hmm, could I rally the chicas for, you know, just to go check this out? Because, uh, you know, the wildflowers around here last year with the rain that we had in Colorado were just amazing and beautiful. And I can only imagine what they look like up there. So, Guys, that was it for the regular questions. We always like to finish the episode out with a round of this or that questions. I'm going to be giving you guys two hiking-related topics, and each of you just respond which one you prefer out of the two. And the first one is, do you prefer a steep incline or a steep decline? I'm going to say neither. I'm a good switchback girl. <laughs> Level. <laughs> yeah. Well, just an easy up and then easy. I don't need anything too crazy. Well, maybe because I'm older now. I don't know. But I like to go up. I'm going to incline. incline. All right. This one's a tough one, but waterfalls or summits? I'm a waterfall girl. That's a tough one. Yeah. I love both. There's nothing more gratifying than reaching a summit. So I'm going to go summits. Okay. And I think you guys already answered this one, but switchbacks are straight up when it comes to a trail system. Switchback. Yeah, I agree. Switchbacks. And then do you guys rock trek poles or do you hike freehand? Trek poles. I want to go back. I used my first trek poles last summer. So I'm in. And then when it comes to your footwear, are you guys rocking trail runners or do you prefer hiking boots? I'm old school. I, I like a very hard sole. Maybe it's like my, my inner sole, but hiking boots. You know, I'm kind of more of a light hiker, you know, with a solid toe. And now this next one is another trail system question, but do you guys prefer a loop trail or an out and back trail? I'm either. I like a loop because you're seeing new things. So when you guys do come across a body of water, especially in the summer month, do you guys jump in or do you prefer to stay dry? We have a funny thing where everybody has to put their foot in, right? And you have to keep your foot in as long as you can until you can't take it anymore. (laughs) We have a competition with ice cold water. When we come to these bodies of water, lakes or streams or rivers that you have to put your foot in. And we have this competition that see who can put their feet in the longest. So you got to get wet. I love it. (laughs) Now, these last three guys are, are the toughest. But do you guys have a preference between sunset hikes or sunrise hikes? I am a sunrise. I would say I'm probably more of a sunrise. Sunrise? Yeah. Um, You guys have both of these epic seasons, but spring wildflowers or fall colors? Fall colors for me. I'm going spring flowers. And then the last one, guys, when it comes to park systems outside of the national park, do you guys prefer national forests or state parks? I'm going to go with state parks because I do not like crowds. You know, I like both. Nice thing about backpacking is you can get away from the crowds pretty easily. So, yeah, I would definitely, I mean, national parks are national parks for a reason. Well, that was it, guys, for the this or that questions. If folks want to check out Talos and learn more about the great things you guys are doing and check out some of the merchandise that you have, what are some of the places they can find you online? So we're at telusoutdoor.com or on Instagram and Facebook, Telus Outdoor. And we have a local store here in Fort Collins, Colorado. So come visit us. We'll be sure to include those three in the episode show notes so people can check them out. And for listeners, if you're in the Fort Collins area, be sure to check out their um, brick and mortar store. Joe and Melissa, thank you so much for sharing your journey 
both personally and with the company. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your experiences with us. Thank you, Thank Ivan. You, Ivan. I, you're doing great work. Keep it up. Thank you once again to Joe and Melissa for joining us on the latest bonus episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. Be sure to follow TELUS on Instagram at TELUS Outdoor. And for Hikes and Mikes listeners, Joe and Melissa were gracious in providing a promo code to get 10% off your first purchase. Use promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Flip Socks. Whether you're on the trail, on the job, or in the yard, Flip Socks will keep Mother Nature out of your boots with their innovative nylon sleeve. You no longer need to worry about any annoying debris getting trapped in your boots during your hikes. Simply flip down the nylon sleeve over any boot to prevent Mother Nature from finding its way inside, keeping your feet comfortable all day long. To get your first pair, visit flipsockswithaz.com and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10 percent off your order and for listeners who use the promo code at checkout i'll be donating 100 percent of the season two promo code proceeds to big city mountaineers who provide transformative experiences through connections to nature that strengthen life skills and build community for youth and disinvested communities across the nation so if you're tired of bits and pieces of the trail finding its way into your hiking boots pick up a pair of flip socks today with the promo code hikes mikes 10 to get 10 percent off for website and promo code see the episode description